Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Girl Get Up podcast with your host, the Aquarian Chancellor, where I share my story in hopes of inspiring you, the listening audience or the viewers, depending on where you're seeing this, to go out and pursue your infinite possibilities, your infinite potential. So a little bit about me. I am the author and the creator of the Career Strategies for Success Guidebook and the Career Strategies for the Infinite Dreamer. Both together, they are the foundation of the Infinite Dreamers program, a career curriculum designed for youth ages 16 to 25. Okay, and then I also have my personal development, personal transformation workbook, my career strategies for six. Oh, I'm sorry, my career affirmations deck. Oh my goodness. I'm just so tongue-tied today. And then my my career creativity project planner. Oh my goodness. Project planner. <laughs> For the creative woman, the girl get a creative project planner. Oh my goodness. Listen, y'all, I'm so tongue-tied today, but that's okay. It happens. It happens to the best of us. Welcome back to part two of my interview with Minister Michelle Carter Douglas, where she's sharing her story of transformation for her and her family from the de domestic violence um, to freedom and happiness and building legacy from her testimony. So we're going to pick up on part two of this interview. And I'm just so excited. I want to get back into speaking with Miss Michelle. Um, so let's talk about, because last week we talked about legacy and forgiving and um, delving deep into your childhood and mending relationships with your parents, um, your spiritual transformation and understanding the what the Holy Spirit has told you about identifying who your true brothers and sisters in spirit are, even though even your own children and how you your thoughts about that and your beliefs about that. And I thought that that was so awesome. I want to pick back up though. I want to be, I want to help those who might be going through a domestic violence situation. Can you talk about what were some of the signs of domestic violence for those who might be going through it, but cannot quite identify it? Can you share that with the, with the listening audience? Yes, thank you so much. And again, thank you for allowing me on your uh, show and having a platform to talk about domestic violence. Uh, this is a blessing. You are a blessing. Um, my first domestic violence relationship was when I was 15 and a half, sad to say. Um, the individual was also in high school. I think he was uh, 17. Um, and we began dating and, um, he was really nice, you know, at first. Um, and it was something that he was saying and I didn't agree with it. And, um, I think sometimes we as a women, um, we might all might have what some people say, like a, a smart mouth or something, but you know, it, it doesn't warrant a hitting. And so he backhanded me, you know? And so it caught me out of surprise and um, he apologized and different things like that. And that's what I was saying too last week about, you know, the, the cycle, you know, um, and, and the emotions you know, um, where they do something and then they apologize and then you get the gifts and, you know, and, and things like that. And so sometimes, sad to say, people can be so manipulating, narcissistic, uh, cunning, that there are no pre-warning signs. That's why I'm a stickler if somebody makes you feel not okay, 
it's not okay to be in a relationship with them. Because sometimes you, you don't see warning signs. You know, sometimes you don't see a person, whatever. Um, I would say be mindful, um, you know, with, with uh, the use of control, um, limiting your voice. Um, sometimes it's gradual where they try to move you away from your friends and your family. You know, they try that isolation, you know. Um, to this day, I have problems with eye contact because I do believe I might be a little autistic, but I also was conditioned to that because when I was married, you know, my ex-husband always had this thing uh, to where he thought I was flirting with other men. So, you know, I, I do a lot of looking down. Um, also, when I was in school, I got bullied a lot. So going through the halls and stuff, what are you looking at? You know, and so in aggressive situations, I avoided eye contact out of fear, you know? So my thing is, if you feel uncomfortable having a conversation with someone, if you notice that you are starting to avoid eye contact or you're feeling that you can't express your opinion, how you want to express your opinion, because sometimes people, they, they have smart tones. That's, that's the same. Sometimes we as a woman, we will roll our eyes. You know, it doesn't warrant anybody putting their hands on you. So that's my advice. If you cannot be you in front of the person who says that they love you and you love them, that's a red flag. You know, um, going through the cell phone, um, wanting to know your whereabouts. Um, what's another thing that... Um, occur another thing um but this is before the cell phones my ex-husband used to listen on the phone calls when when we had landline phones and i'd be on one phone talking and he'd be on the other phone like this listening you're now listening on your phone calls you know now there's a thing to where People could put like a tracking thing on your cell phone. You know, if they're doing things like that, wanting to know where you're at and different things like that. Um, I had a situation where I was working at a group home and my ex-husband thought I had something going on with a male coworker, and he started showing up to my job and they had to let me go for that. So showing up at your job, you know, wanting to um, uh, talk to your coworkers, you know, to see what relationship or rapport you have. Um, those are some of the things. Mm -hmm. So we know about the physical, you know, like the grabbing or talk about something really quickly because you said it started your first experience was 15 years old right and um teenagers I want to talk about the teenage relationships and boyfriend girlfriend stuff because I think that because at that young age there's a fine line okay with playing okay and then actually being um physically abusive that level of awareness that young to know because and, and and I'm saying this because I tell my my daughter all the time like don't be so aggressive when you're playing with your brother you know they do little stuff like that and I have to tell her don't do that because that transfers over into when you're young and you know you want to get into these little boyfriend girlfriend relationships they not your brothers 
you know, you, you have to be very mindful about that and um, teaching early our young young sons and daughters early to not even just play don't play like that period don't play like that i know with your brothers and your, you you know if certain things is allowed but when you're calling yourself dating and you get your first boyfriend and stuff like that that level of awareness to say okay this is a different type of relationship playing hitting and pushing should not be allowed um first part of my question because it's something else that you talked about but I want to start there were you able to talk to your mom and did she give you any advice about that because you guys were so young how to identify playing and then actual aggression now, the one thing, and I say, and I, I, I give accolades again from my parenting, from my mother and my uh, grandmother and grandfather, because I learned at a young age, we did not play fight because it was always instilled, you don't play hit because if somebody hits you too hard, okay, all bet. And I raised my kids that way. You know, I raised my kids that way. So with, with my case with domestic violence, it never was that. It was the situation, like I said, I was saying something and, you know, I, I will say sometimes I think all people might have that time. We're like, well, I, you know, like that, you know, you say things, you know. Um, and again, I was 15 and a half. So, you know, that's the time that we, you know, I think say things get a little mouthy or whatever else. And he backhanded me. And so I never told my mother how my family found out I was in a domestic violence relationship. Um, a friend of the family, Herb Tinsley, um, saw him hit me. You know, yeah, saw him hit me and um, it got back to my family. And so then if there was a conversation, how long has this been going on? And so at that time, you know, I wasn't supposed to see him anymore. I was sneaking out. Um, then it was this one uh, situation to where I told him I had to get home. And so he got upset. And so when he got out the car to try to pull me out the car, I ended up locking the doors and he broke the window and there was glass all over me. And I remember him taking me home, not home, his house. And he actually gave me a bath to get the glass off so that I could go back home. So it was, it was a very toxic relationship um how it ended um believe it or not he ended up breaking up with me and dating someone else which was good but i ended up getting in another domestic violence relationship uh, because of the the feeling that that high and that low you know you go through the the drama and then you know that that make up uh, you know, that that high experience of the attention that you're getting, you know, for the offense and not be learning to not be uh, emotionally connected to that, that that high period. Um, I want to talk about something else that you kind of touched on. You talked around it, but I want to talk about the difference between control and then protecting your relationship. Because we all know when you're in a marriage, is you there's certain thing you have to protect your relationship from, you know, it's going to be outside influences. That means so, you know, like not sharing a lot of the things that you go through within your marriage with a lot of outside people, family, friends, because it other people's opinion could, you know, be a, a catalyst to destroy your relationship. Can you talk about the difference between protecting your relationship 
and then controlling the person that you're with. And I'm glad you asked that question because you can never control a perpetrator. You can never control the abuser. The abuser controls you by force and by fear, you know? And so with that being said, um, through being in these volatile situations, because they weren't relationships, um, I learned to suppress my voice because I didn't want people to know because one, I was embarrassed and two, I felt that I could love them. And three, um, they were in a sense providers, you know, um, the one, um, because after I got out of the relationship with the one individual and um, because it's true, you know, um, his name was Luane Rowe. And so I got out of a relationship with him, but he broke up with me. He was dating somebody else. And so um, my next relationship at that time uh, was with the older man. And so I began you know, that, and um, it was like, they become your provider, you know? And so you kind of like are controlled by the money, you know? And then a certain thing thinking, oh, well, you know what? I must be intelligent because they're older and I'm younger and so, I must be smart. You know what I mean? So I would just, you know, um, let people know that one of which people like that try to control you and establish your own worth by knowing that you do not have to be controlled because control is a hindrance. It diminishes your ability. It, it it tries to extinguish your esteem. And relationships, healthy relationships are supposed to be of growth where two people are supposed to grow individually and collectively. So therefore in healthy relationships, you know, it should be one party has their group of friends and they can have their time together. The other uh, relationship, uh, the person in a relationship can have their friends, their time together. Um, and then, you know, there's going to be maybe friends that um, you guys have together that maybe not uh, include uh, the two separate things. And that's okay. Because, you know, we're all individuals. Um, so that's, does that answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. Because I think, like I said, I think there's always, when you're married, especially young, when you're um, early in your marriage, it's always good to have people to look up to. It's, every marriage is not going to be the same, you know. People have different things, you know, that they do or, or whatever. That's their business. But what I want to get, the, you know, across to the audience is there is a difference between controlling your partner and then protecting your relationship. Because you might have someone who doesn't like, oh, I don't like that you hang out with such and such and such and such. But there's a difference but between saying, oh, I don't want you hanging out with such as I don't like that person. But even though that's been a long time friend, they may not like that person, but they're not prohibiting you or restricting someone's relationship. So I wanted to, to clear or make it clear that there is a difference between protecting your, your marriage or your relationship and then controlling the person. So I wanted to just to clear that up. Amen. It, Thank you for that. Control being one of those signs of, you know, of uh, 
how it starts domestic violence. Amen. So, you know, my, my, this is my own personal philosophy and belief. Um, now again, with individuals having their own friends, like one thing I know when the Lord blesses me to be in a relationship, um, there cannot be a person that's trying to infiltrate a healthy relationship because, you know, um, sometimes you have those, those friends that don't want to see the other person succeed, you know, and they may see that, okay, this is a good guy. You know what I'm saying? And I kind of want him for myself. You know, you have to watch that as well. So like my thing is just establishing those boundaries. And I'm learning so much uh, currently in school, you know, about boundaries. Boundaries are excellent. You know, one of which in a friendship, if you're in a healthy relationship with someone, your friend should not have that welcome mat to discuss their personal opinion about your significant other or spouse. As long as the spouse, the significant other is not abusive or if they are not doing anything to that individual, keep your opinions to yourself because that again comes back to the Bible. The, the God says, do not give the enemy a foothold. Now this again is by thought, word, or deed. And also you got people that love to stir the pot. They're secretly not happy behind closed doors. So they don't want you to be. So my thing is, if I'm in a relationship with a good man and my kids is good with him, because ultimately, you know, in dating, um, my last friend, you know, that, you know, whatever, whatever. But he had to meet my kids first, okay? And so if they weren't okay with him, they have the they have the they have the right to to tell me, you know, and not in front of him. You know, you always be respectable. I told my kids, you be respectable. Um, and they had the opportunity, you know, to tell me, you know, well, I don't, and I'm listening, and then it's not gonna go because I'm not gonna have a relationship to where there's a tug of war. I'm just not doing it. I'm too old, you know. So that's my only thing. Establish boundaries. If you're in a healthy relationship, your so-called friend does not have that, that welcome mat to try to put things in your ear because it will affect. Yeah, absolutely. That, you, I love that word boundaries. I love that word boundaries because that's one of the things that I learned through my transition period is that I didn't have any. And that was because, again, you know, you you evaluate your your life story, and um, so you learn along the way. Okay, so now I, I know that this was my shortcoming here. Okay, now I know what I need to do. I need to start establishing boundaries, and uh, boundaries have a lot to do with how you feel about yourself and that self esteem that you start off talking about in part one. How well do you love yourself? Okay. Somebody, I, I was on scrolling on TikTok, right? And um I, this lady, she was talking about packaging. She was talking and she said everything that we want or need is wrapped up in everything that we need is wrapped up in something that we don't want. And I said, I said, ooh, right? I said, hold on, wait a minute. That kind of hit me a little bit different. <laughs> it kind of hit me in my, in my soul a little bit. I was like, ooh. And my thing with that is, is that we have to protect ourselves. We have to protect ourselves. People do that in many different ways. But um, at the at the the core of it, how well do you do you care about yourself? Because if it's something that you need, okay, and it's worth something to you, you're going to protect it. And that goes with yourself as well. Um, I want to talk about 
coming out of that situation and the amazing thing that you did was not just focus on telling or or the uh, testimony being just about you. You made it also about your kids. How important was that for for you? Um, it was very important because again, I'm giving shout out to the Holy Spirit, our Creator, God Almighty, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, because. One quality that I have that I love that God created me about is being selfless, you know? And the fact that he blessed me with these beautiful people, you know, my, my one daughter's in heaven, Kayla, Michelle, and, um, you know, he blessed me with my, my son, Patrick, my daughter, Alessa. And my youngest son, Brylin, and like I said, my Kayla's in, in, in heaven. And so how can I go forward talking about my testimony in truth when they got a bigger testimony in truth? Because they're survivors too. And, and then the Holy Spirit allowed me to understand there are families in there, you know, uh, other women that are in domestic violence relationships, maybe staying in it because they, they want their kids, you know, um, to have a father or don't know how to get out. Um, also, you know, unfortunately, there's people who are selfish, you know, where they're in a domestic violence relationship and then they fought their kid for what the father is doing. Well, the kids didn't pick the father. You did. You know, so I know that God Almighty chose me and my children and others, because there's others out there, to tell this story, to help others come forward, and for more parents to understand and see that our kids are a blessing. And so that, that, because uh, that, that, that started it. And, and my youngest son, Brylin, he began writing uh, his one uh, story, The Adventures of Jerry Young in, in third grade um, as a uh, Simon in school. And then Arlessa, I think she was in middle school when she started writing. And Patrick, he started writing The Adventures of Gurga Boy when he was in high school. And so when I looked at their little stuff that they had and they had saw when my first book got published, I knew then I was like, no, these, these kids coming with me. We, we all coming up the rough side of the mountain together, you know? Mm -hmm. So how did you foster that and encourage that? Because one of the things that I talk about in my platform with in my Infinite Dreamers program is believing in your infinite possibilities and your infinite potential and uh, stepping outside of those boxes. How did you do that with them with defying age? Not saying, oh no, you're too young. Or how did you foster um, and nurture their level of creativity as a parent to keep their to keep that open and not being afraid to tell or express themselves um one of which uh, and i go back to the scripture we could do all things through christ who strengthens us and there's no age on there and matter of fact when we go to the scripture and a child should lead them you know so it's like and, and you can see this through my kids' writing. They, their, their journey is better than mine. You know what I mean? And so what I did was I had a conversation with them and um, how they would feel about them too, including their story. And I let them know, you know, there might be some people that say some negative, but I let them know, like, I'm right here with you. God is right here with you. You got protection angels. 
and this is going to help other people, you know, and they were all on board and just the constant encouraging. Um, I created a space in our house um, and it was, and it's, it's called the creator's workspace. So I created a workspace just like they was going to work. You know, I buy a whole bunch of stuff on Amazon, little uh, paint things and stuff. They got a lot of their canvases and stuff now. And so uh, they had, they each had a little uh, like card and it goes in, out. So they wrote their time in, they wrote their time out and they got a lounge for it. Like they, they was working, getting paid. So that was nice. Uh that they had that in, I, 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 I think the best thing was when their books got published and my former publisher, Sandra Carrington Smith, came up with the idea. When they got a copy of the book, she wanted them to take a picture holding that book. And that I think brought everything to fruition because a lot of times, um, we're set up with these obstacles and uh, God created all people. I love all people, white, black, Puerto Rican, all people. Um, in some cases, I think, though, being honest, sometimes I think minorities are not encouraged in certain fields and authorship is one of them. Because I know I got a lot of backlash, you know, from people black and white, you know, about, you know, uh, our written works, especially some of mine, you know, my poetry. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. You know, they talked about Jesus. So just creating that, that workspace, giving them encouragement, following through. Like there was times I was depressed. You know, and I didn't feel like overseeing or whatever. And I said, look, God instilled me with the job and the blessing of being a parent. I thought I couldn't have kids. I was actually trying to have kids in my first relationship at 15 and a half. And I thought I couldn't have kids until I was married and had my son, Patrick. I, I was sick and I didn't know what was going on. They said, oh, you're pregnant. I was like, hallelujah. You know, so I just think that, and again, everything that was a blocker in our lives and what I saw that uh, people were going through in our communities, we have it in this book, Think It Outside the Plantation. <laughs> I was just about to talk about that because something that you said struck a huge chord in me. You said that you had set up a creativity workspace and they was clocking in and they was clocking out. And that book that you have in your hand has a very specific title. Could you read that for the audience, please? Yes. Thinking Outside the Plantation. Let's talk about that. The Tell the audience what this what this book is about. Um, this book is uh written by myself, Patrick M. Douglas, my son, Rylan uh, Douglas, my son, and Arlessa Douglas, uh, my daughter. See, when we think about the plantation, uh, some minds go back to slavery. But what is slavery? Because all nationalities in one aspect was enslaved. Slavery is oppression. Oppression of what? Oppression of fear. Okay. And so with this book breaks down, why does the adversary himself and uses people through manipulation and fear, oppression, domestic violence, abuse, try to use the slavery of the mind to uh, enslave us to, to, to hinder our abilities. And it's because of fear. We are the rice, the, the indigo, the sugar cane. And in this book, we talk about the origin of how slavery came to be and how supremacy came to be because the adversary 
uh, was created with all these beautiful jewels. And so therefore, based on his looks, he felt he was more supreme than our creator. So that's why we see, we talk about racism. We talk about um, discrimination. We talk about uh, black on black crime, but we're really not understanding that it's not the people, it's the spirit. Okay, so that's what the plantation is. People have to understand plantation is not a place. Plantation is of the mind. Okay. I'm over here going crazy because let me tell you something. Throughout my, my journey, you know, I've been delving into different topics and I do this on my own for my own um, self-awareness, right? One thing that has been continuously coming up for me, right, is desire, desire. And um, you talked about several things. It's been a theme and I, in my mind, I'm just like, you know, I'm just like confirmation, confirmation, but um, desire, right? And we can hit desire all things. You can desire uh, sex. Uh, money, all of those things. But see, if you don't have a level of discipline of the mind and of the spirit, you're going to fall for with the eye. Okay. <laughs> the, see, this is what I'm talking It goes back to what I was saying about what you need is a wrapped up in a package that you don't want. And anyway, I'm going to let you go ahead on and break that thing down. You know what? We we gonna have to do a workshop together. You know, I mean for real because like God, this is this is the body of Christ, okay? Collectively coming together, and I'm just gonna give an accolade before I talk more about this book. And I thank you for donating your workbook so I can donate uh, that to uh, a domestic violence survivor in need, and that's what God called us to be. And um, I just know and pray that you are going to be the New York's bestseller. I claim it in the name of Jesus. Yes, just remember us. Okay, okay. And and that's what this. Hey, ooh, go ahead. No, I was just saying absolutely because you know what's so funny is the <laughs> listen. There's so much we could talk about. But um, through that shedding period and letting go and transformation and knowing what you can take on you, take with you for your next journey in life. I'm almost 40 years old and the things that the people, places and things had to change. Right. But what it did do was open up the door for me to meet new people that were part of my soul family that's going to help me along my journey. And I'm so appreciative of that every Every I don't want to get emotional, but every night and every morning, I always give thanks and show gratitude for that. But I'm gonna go. I'm gonna. I'm gonna give up the floor back to you. Man, Amen. Holy Spirit, Amen. And it's and it's a blessing. And I thank you for bringing that up because the one quote that I love is not everybody is able to go with you on the next journey. You know, and and. In this book, it talks so many things and it also it gives examples. And I'm going to read uh, an excerpt out of the book. Um, but one of which it, it starts with uh, the origin of, of supremacy with uh, the adversary in heaven coveting our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ and God and then manipulating Adam and Eve because the adversary is jealous of mankind. He's jealous of us, you know? And that's when the plantation, the spirit, the adversary spirit came, you know? Um, also in this book is, is scriptures to document the theories. Um, and also it has a study guide included. Um, it talks about random procreation. Some people are talking about why do all these people have all these kids? Well, again, it comes from that plantation spirit, abuse, molestation, rape, 
uh, addiction, um, d discrimination, uh, you know, racism, all of that are systematic plantations that were constructed by the adversary to cripple mankind's mind so that we begin to fault God. You know, a lot of people say, well, all this bad is happening. Uh, how can there be a God? Well, remember, God gave rules and regulations. We were supposed to follow them through. And the, the one um, thing um, I love about this is that um, my kids and I, we came up um, with two stories, um, one of which uh, loosely based on um, some of the things that I went through, you know, um, but very loosely based. Um, and the one, uh, the two stories is one, the story of Natasha and the story of Marcus, um, allowing people to try to think outside the box, okay? And evolve off the plantation. Um, and this is the story of Natasha, a young female, five foot one inch and slightly on the heavier side, sits at the edge of a cliff, gazing into the horizon. Her deep brown eyes, once full of life, currently mirrors hopelessness. Her father, a prestigious and well-liked man, physically, emotionally, and mentally abused her behind closed doors. It tore her apart inside. People in the community would adore him and compliment him on his social accolades while looking down on her. Natasha was bullied at school and labored to fit in with her peers. She was a loner and struggled to, struggled to make friends. Natasha longed to have someone to confide in her and her troubles weighed heavy on her soul. As she sits on the edge of this cliff, overlooking intense waters and huge rocks, she thinks about God. The young female reco re recollects about a loving savior and a powerful and loving God. She prayed that this abuse from her father would stop. And it, while she's here, she then begins to contemplate suicide. And this has nothing to do with uh, my mother. Actually, it's about my domestic um, relationship with my ex-husband because he was and is very well liked, you know? And so as I, I, I ask people, before you judge a person and call them socially awkward or uh, anti-social, I was working at a job, a telemarketing place, Alorica, and one of my coworkers said that I was anti-social, which people who know me know that's not term, that's not even true. I love people. I just don't like Satan and I don't like abusers. You know, I don't like bullies. So I, I'm not anti-social, but nobody wants to know the story. And this story goes on to her dealing with different things and if she is able to have intercession and not be able to uh, give in to those voices of suicide because suicide is of the plantation too. And then the next is Marcus's testimony who Marcus becomes uh, the breadwinner for his uh, siblings because the mother has an addiction. And so the mother is promiscuous. And so she brings random men over her children. And this man abuses one of his sister, you know, physically. And so Marcus wants to take vengeance in his own hand. And so in the book, it talks about that if he's able to have intercession or if he takes matter in his own hands. Also, the character Marcus in the book um, sells drugs. And, and some people have a judgy opinion on people who 
I'll sell drugs. I don't condone it or whatever else like that. But then when you look behind closed doors, you have some that maybe do it for a thrill, but then maybe you have some that went into that lifestyle because that's all that they knew and they're trying to provide for their family. And so um, I don't know um, if you can uh, see, but also in this book, uh, this book as well has an instructor manual and a study guide. It has notes that you could take from the book. It also has a glossary and different things like that. Um, I'm going to be sending you a copy is this one too. Yes, yes. Please do, please do. Because I'm over here. I'm like, oh my God. Because when you, let's talk about intercession. Because I think um, for the listening audience, is that an intervention or that, that crossroads point where you're about to make a life-changing decision? That's what it sounds like. Yes. 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 Yeah. Ooh, and that's that's heavy. And you know what I talk about this in my program, my first module is making the decision. And it's a self-analysis of what's going on around you because I talk about selling drugs. Are you using drugs? I talk about are you um, involving yourself in with law enforcement? Like if you're finding yourself getting in trouble, are you, and it has to do with your time not having anything to do, not having a, a mentor or someone who can help you. The program is designed to for the youth to kind of like take analysis of their own situation, which creates um, decision-making and critical thinking. They're able to be aware of their surroundings and make sound decisions based on what they're seeing a lot of times and i'm just listening to what you were just saying about the drug you i'm um, the drug selling drugs and stuff like that and again i'm with you i don't condone it but i do know that there are situations where they're not exposed to anything else they're not exposed to a working parent they don't know what that means and i'm gonna tell you something with the one thing about I, I like about social media is that the, the ability to connect, right? We're we're not limited in our relationships. You and I were able to build a relationship, right? But the downside to that is the portrayal of various cultures, specifically us of color, um, worldwide of drugs and prostitution and shaking our butts. And this is all that we're about. And so people may not see, you know, like the the middle working class or, or upper class, they don't see that. Or they don't, when they think of Black America, they don't think about that. They think about what's been portrayed, the drug use and this and that. And um, I think it's important for us to see that we don't have to fall into that concept of who we are because it's been given to us it's been given to us in music it's been given to us in tv and radio and all of this stuff that portrays everybody as gangsters and strippers and stuff like that and i think that that's that plantation mindset the adversarial mindset that we have to we have to be conscious that our decision making that we make right now in this life, it doesn't matter. I think it it what about 14 that all of those seeds that your parents have planted in you, that's when they're starting to grow. We are able to make those decisions. Um, and it's important for the youth to know that those decisions are right around that time are going to be the decisions that you're going to be living with for the rest of your life. What do you think about that? I definitely agree. And also, I even think it is um, instilling um, the seed and the knowledge of, of God and wisdom and, you know, that that higher um, spiritual education comes even before, you know, 14. Because like I think about being a little girl and um, singing hymns, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And then in Sunday school, learning different scriptures that 
stood out to me. Um, do on to others as you want others to do on to you. Um, and then the, the hymn, um, he has the whole world in his hand. He has the little bitty baby in his hand. Um, he has the mother and the father in his hands. And all of that, believe it or not, helped me in the darkest times. It helped me through that domestic violence. It helped me through the loss of, of my baby. Um, because at a young age, I learned that God is always listening. Like in my one book, Restoring Your Inner Peace, I share about when I was five years old and I was picking, I thought yellow roses, but they were dandelions. So I picked a bouquet of yellow roses and I was holding them up to the sky so God would come down and get them. And my girlfriend said, Michelle, what are you doing? And I said, I'm, 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 I got flowers for God. And she said, well, lay them right there. He'll get them. You know, and as a woman, I understood what my grandmother was saying. Whatever you have for God, he will meet you right there. And that helped me because even though I say to myself, God, I wish my baby was here and you could have took me. And I know that that was a piece of heaven that God blessed me with to instill in me the ministry to allow me the blessing of my kids that I have here. And so my little girl, Kayla, is all the inspiration and also my reward. Because the moment, see, this is what people don't understand. When you do good to people, it's a bliss. And it's a peace. Because on that sweet morning when God comes for me, the angel of death, because he does the body of God. On that sweet morning when I close my eyes, I know I did right by people. I know I did right by my kids. I know I did right by God and Jesus. And I get to hold that baby again. And I had a miscarriage in between my oldest son, Patrick, and my daughter, Arlesa. So I get to meet that baby too. I don't know if it's a son or a daughter, but I get to meet them too. And I get to meet my grandmother again, my grandfather. And so that's, that's what thinking outside the plantation is about to. When you get off the systematic plantations that the adversary is still here on earth, you will receive that paradise from God where there's no more death, there's no more pain. We can run, there's no obesity, there's no diabetes, there's no cancer. It's just peace, peace in the valley. Well, I do, you know, I'm sorry to hear about your daughter, but um, I think this has been an awesome conversation. I just feel so, I love the, I love the, this is the stuff that I love to connect and talk to people about because um, I think as I am, so are you, we all have um, stories that we connect around. And when you're talking about judging people, um, a lot of times when we do that, you're you're judging yourself as well. You're judging yourself as well. You have to, like you said, meet people where they are. God meets you where you are. And so um, it's just so beautiful. I love talking to people, allowing them to share their story because it's growing. It, it It's freeing and it allows for you to grow. Let me say it there. So do you have any last words that you would like to say to the audience about um, just recovering, even though we go through dark times, to not let that be your story? And that's what the uh, identifying and understanding what your infinite potential and your infinite possibilities is all about. Do you have any last words for the audience? 
Um, you know what? My last words is don't isolate yourself. Step off the plantation, think outside the box, network, connect with people. Um, I'm diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, chronic. And um, one of my things when I experience triggers is I want to just go back and isolate, but the devil is a liar. And so I just encourage people to also encourage all authors um, like uh, uh, the Aquarian Chancellor, you know, her written works that I pray will be in juvenile justice centers, you know, domestic violence shelters, you know, and colleges, you know, um, because our world needs healing. Right now, uh, pray for Ukraine, uh, Africa, people in the United States, and uh, Hamas, Israel. Um, just, you know, encourage yourself also. And do what God ordained you to do. Prosper. Because God created us to prosper. Amen. Well, thank you, Michelle, for Minister Michelle Carter Douglas for joining me today and allowing for the audience of the Girl Get Up podcast to hear and to understand and to take in your story in hopes that it'll help them identify their infinite possibilities and their infinite potential. You don't have to stay down. We all experience situations, okay? And But it's happening for our growth. You have to see the opportunity. Sometimes I know, you know, sometimes we, we want to stay down, but no. This is the call. You better get up, girl, get up. And some of you guys too. So with that, I'm not going to get into all of the, the stuff, the, the house cleaning stuff. Go to my website, www.yourinfinitedirection.com. And thank you for tuning in with me today on the Girl Get Up podcast. Take care, everybody.